we have to start with this tweet from DeepMind governance researcher Toby Shevlane. Each AI org must pivot to its strengths. Anthropic, CERN for AI safety. Strength, alignment research. DeepMind and OpenAI, Apollo programs for AI. Strength, ambitious projects. And Meta, Wuhan Institute of Virology for AI. Strength, lab leaks. This tweet may have just set a new SOTA for AI org level trash talk. Welcome to AI safety and capabilities news with Samuel Albany. First up, the UN chief says that we must take the threat posed by AI seriously, and that alarm bells are deafening. New technology is moving at warp speed, and so are the threats that come with it. Alarm bells over the latest form of artificial intelligence, generative AI, are deafening. And they are loudest from the developers who designed it. The scientists and experts have called on the world to act, declaring AI an existential threat to humanity on a par with the risk of nuclear war. We must take those warnings seriously. Anthropic has released a blog post called Charting a Path to AI Accountability. This makes recommendations calling on government agencies to first, fund research to build better evaluations. Anthropic suggests that companies deploying AI systems should be mandated to satisfy some disclosure requirements with regard to their evaluations, though these requirements need not be made public if doing so would compromise intellectual property or confidential information. Second, create risk-responsive assessments based on model capabilities. This includes the suggestion to develop a risk threshold through more research and funding into safety evaluations. Once a risk threshold has been established, we can mandate evaluations for all models against this threshold. They provide further suggestions to establish pre-registration for large AI training runs, to empower third-party auditors that are technically literate, security conscious and flexible, mandate external red teaming before model release, advance interpretability research, and enable industry collaboration on AI safety via clarity around antitrust. There's an interesting tension here. Anthropic points out that clarifying how private companies can work together in the public interest without violating antitrust laws would mitigate legal uncertainty and advance shared goals. A piece from Roman Yampolsky entitled I am an AI expert, here's my worst case scenario, discusses the AI control problem. Despite the recognition that the problem of AI control may be one of the most important problems facing humanity, it remains poorly understood, poorly defined and poorly researched. A computer science problem could be either solvable, unsolvable, undecidable, or partially solvable. But we don't know the actual status of the AI control problem. Roman suggests that the statistics look very compelling in support of a major AI safety effort. We are looking at an almost guaranteed event with the potential to cause an existential catastrophe. This is not a low-risk, high-reward scenario, but a high-risk, negative-reward situation. He also notes that there seems to be a lack of published evidence to conclude that a less intelligent agent can indefinitely maintain control over a more intelligent agent. Instead of asking what can AI do for us, we should be asking what can AI do to us. The BBC reports on comments by AI pioneer Jan LeCun, who takes a somewhat different perspective. Will AI take over the world? No. This is a projection of human nature on machines, he said. It would be a huge mistake to keep AI research under lock and key, he added. Interestingly, his view is not that AI won't get very powerful. He said there was no question that AI would surpass human intelligence, but researchers were still missing essential concepts to reach that level, which would take years, if not decades, to arrive. There was a fear that when AGI existed, scientists get to turn on a superintelligent system that is going to take over the world within minutes, he said. That's, you know, just preposterously ridiculous. Tony Blair and William Haig, who were at one point the heads of the opposing Labour and Tory UK political parties, have come together to write a report called A New National Purpose. AI promises a world-leading future of Britain. One recommendation is to increase the size of the UK AI research resource to 30,000 accelerators, require regular reviews determined by the AI task force in order to update scale when necessary, The UK should also build to exascale capacity within a year, instead of the current target of 2026, renting compute time if necessary. Given the significance of AI, they say that the state must be reoriented to this challenge. Major changes are needed to how the government is organised, works with the private sector, promotes research, draws on expertise and receives advice. The report communicates a level of self-awareness. The experience required for global AI development is held by a small, highly sought-after pool of people, mostly based in private labs and definitely not in the Whitehall system. 
Other observations include the comment that companies that control advanced AI systems could become more powerful than any private organization in history, to the point that their power could exceed that of the state itself. It is therefore time for a reorg, they say, because everyone loves a good reorg. For example, they cite Martin Goodson's commentary and say that the Alan Turing Institute has demonstrably not kept the UK at the cutting edge of international AI developments. The Alan Turing Institute's AI function should be wound down and a new endeavour, Sentinel, should be funded. There are also some interesting comments about open source. They say that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to being open or closed, but the UK currently lacks a clear position on open source. Given that the EU's amended AI Act weakens the position of the open source community, the UK has a clear chance to offer a different model. In conclusion, the future is already here, they say. The real question is how the country chooses to meet it. Very pithy. At this point, we can ask just how far have AI models advanced recently? Could a large language model get a graduate degree at MIT in mathematics or electrical engineering and computer science? Yes, basically. According to this recent work, exploring the MIT mathematics and EECS curriculum using large language models. This work evaluates the ability of large language models to fulfill the graduation requirements for any MIT major in mathematics and EECS. They report the striking result that GPT-4, with prompt engineering, achieves a perfect solve rate on a test set, excluding questions based on images. Now, it's important to note that the authors employ GPT-4 to automatically grade model responses, so there is some potential for noise. Still, I'd expect this to work pretty reliably. One technical contribution is expert prompting. This uses the LLM to identify experts in the field, generate answers as if the experts wrote them, and combine the experts' answers by collaborative decision-making. This involves prompting with phrases like, give an educated guess of the three experts most capable of solving this question. The model is then asked to emulate one of these experts when solving the problem. On their test set, the authors find that stable Vicuna 13b scores 48%, Llama 30b with fine-tuning scores 47%, while GPT-4 scores 90%. With Fewshot, it gets to 93 Adding in chain of thought prompting gets to 95, adding self-critique gets to 97, and finally, adding in experts gets to a perfect score. A paper from a couple of weeks ago asks, can large language models democratize access to dual-use biotechnology? Researchers tasked non-scientist students with investigating whether LLM chatbots could be prompted to assist non-experts in causing a pandemic. In just one hour, the chatbot suggested four potential pandemic pathogens, explained how they could be generated from synthetic DNA using reverse genetics, supplied the names of DNA synthesis companies unlikely to screen orders, identified detailed protocols and how to troubleshoot them, and recommended that anyone lacking the skills to perform reverse genetics engage a core facility or contract research organisation. Collectively, these results suggest that LLMs will make pandemic class agents widely accessible as soon as they are credibly identified, even to people with little or no laboratory training. The authors propose a potential mitigation. They note that, to reliably mitigate harms, consider that an LLM cannot disclose or conceptually reason using information it lacks. If biotechnology and information security experts were to identify the set of publications most relevant to causing mass death, and LLM developers curated their training datasets to remove those publications and related online information, then future models trained on the curated data would be far less capable of providing anyone intent on harm with conceptual insights and recipes for the creation or enhancement of pathogens. The vast majority of relevant publications are in the field of virology, and to a lesser extent, synthetic biology and bacteriology. A preliminary assessment suggests that removing under 1% of all publications in PubMed, and a far smaller percentage of all scientific research, would suffice to eliminate nearly all of the risk. This level of curation would not be without costs. LLMs would be less able to contribute to research in the affected fields. However, any such contributions remain distant and theoretical, whereas the non-proliferation benefits would be practical and immediate. This seems pragmatic, though as the models become more powerful, it remains to be seen how many dual-use recipes will be simply obvious to them, even without explicit training data. Now, have you ever seen a mistake in a results table in a scientific paper? The answer, if you are a researcher, is probably yes. That's the motivation for this work, which includes your humble narrator as an author. When a researcher proposes a new framework, model or algorithm, it is often informative to compare their contribution with prior work by comparing performance metrics. 
In practice, to enable the comparison, it is common for the researcher to manually copy performance metrics from the original manuscript into their own manuscript. While pragmatic, this copying process is susceptible to human error. Basically, we lack a spell checker for manually copied scientific data. It's a difficult task, because when papers report results, they often don't use the same names for method. Sometimes they'll just describe their own work as ours. To study this task, the paper introduces a benchmark dataset named ArchiveVery, sourced from publicly accessible papers on Archive. We look at whether GPT-4 can solve this task. The answer is sometimes. The green boxes are examples where it was able to match cells across different tables. The orange cells are where it gets the matching wrong. The model is still too weak to solve this task currently without help, but it's easy to imagine future iterations giving us automatic checks. Lastly, I'll mention a project we're working on called Filter, a ChatGPT plugin that fact checks its outputs. Now, to test it out, I'll ask GPT-4 to tell me a short sentence about who invented the light bulb. It says the light bulb was invented by Thomas Edison in 1879. Let's ask GPT-4 to fact check this. This triggers a call to filter, which is going to search for evidence to back it up. It tells us that the claim that the light bulb was invented by Thomas Edison in 1879 is only partially supported. While Thomas Edison did significant work on the development of a practical and long-lasting incandescent light bulb, he was not the first to invent the light bulb. Then we get some information about earlier inventors like Warren de la Rue and Moses G. Farmer. Then we are given some references. We can click on a reference to see that, indeed, Edison built on the work of others, and find descriptions of the previous inventors mentioned by Filter. It's important to note that Filter is an early prototype, and the fact-checking is still imperfect, so you must still verify its outputs. Its main use right now is to help you fact-check GPT outputs more efficiently. Starting today, it's available for ChatGPT Plus users. We've reached the end. I hope you have a wonderful day.